Thank you very much, Annabelle, for leading us in the time of worship in music. We now come to continue our worship in the listening to God's Word. And we, of course, continue in our sermon series uh, on our higher values of integrity, TPMC values integrity. And today, we listen to the Word of God that TPMC values integrity in suffering. And our scripture passage today is taken from Job chapter 2, verse 3. Listen now to the word of the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Christians in other parts of the world face violence if they choose to maintain their faith in Jesus. I recall a story of an African Christian who was given a choice by his captors. Either renounce Christ or watch them cut off his daughter's fingers one by one. And so he was given 10 chances to renounce Jesus. In Singapore, we may not face such kinds of suffering, but every day, those who are suffering chronic pain in their sickness, whether in their bodies or in their minds, or some material lack, or some other forms of hardship, must decide whether to curse God or to get a quick buck by hook or by crook. Suffering often tests our integrity. Job was a man commended by God to have held fast to his integrity, even in deep suffering. And Job's story is a heart-piercing one. His story recorded in the book of Job in the Bible opens with this glowing description of Job. It says there, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. And by all accounts, Job was a prosperous man, and he would have been the envy of many. Now one day, Satan came before God, and the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. Well, in very blunt terms, God made a wager with Satan that Job's integrity and faith in God could not be shaken by Satan. And Satan took up the wager and he went off to test Job. And Satan tested Job in a devastating way. In a single day, Satan wiped out Job's riches and Satan caused the death of all of Job's seven sons and three daughters. Now when Job received the news, the Bible tells us he arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And Job proved God right. His integrity could not be shaken by Satan. But again, Satan came before God, and for a second time, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. What? Another wager? 
And this time, Satan struck Job with a skin disease that caused painful sores from head to toe. Job was tormented, and the only way he could get at some relief from his pain was by scratching his sores with a piece of broken pottery. He was in a pathetic state, and seeing him in that state, his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and not evil? Or, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. A few verses later, the author starkly writes, Job's suffering was very great. Now, in the story of Job, we have one of the most disturbing and controversial stories in the Bible. And it can evoke so many questions. Questions like, is God one who wages with human lives? How can God set up a righteous person to suffer at the hands of Satan like this? If God allows or even sets in motion events for an innocent man to suffer, is God really good or is he actually evil? Are our human lives mere playthings for frivolous divine beings? And perhaps you have even more questions than these. And if we are called to put our trust in God fully, then definitely these questions are important, but they are not our focus for our sermon today. But if you are interested in these questions or you have others that you wish to ask, then do come on the 19th of May at 1.30 p.m. to Hall 2, and there we can grapple with these questions together. But for now, one important statement can be made to address questions like these. And the statement is this, we are not Job. Whatever assessments we can make about God regarding Job, Job's assessment of God must be given more weight than any of our hours, than any of ours. Because he was the sufferer, we are the bystanders. And as bystanders, we may judge God to be frivolous, wicked, and, just, and unjust. But Job's personal encounter with God in his suffering led him to discern and to decide otherwise. And you know, it is interesting how suffering can lead many observers of suffering who are actually not themselves suffering to be disillusioned with God. But suffering seems to lead many sufferers to find peace in God. And Job's final assessment of God is that God is God, Job is not. Job realized that the world and what it takes God to create and sustain it is beyond human understanding and control. Some things simply have no explanations that will satisfy human curiosity and indignance. Not because they cannot be explained, but because our capacity to understand is ultimately limited. And we hate to accept that. And this goes against every grain of our being, but in this fallen world, there is such a thing as unexplained and undeserved suffering. There is such a thing that even the righteous will suffer. And even worse, there is such a thing that many will suffer precisely for being righteous. In our finite wisdom, we grapple with how grave injustices and suffering can happen to the righteous if God is indeed truly good and powerful. But Job, uh, Job's assessment of God was that even though he may never understand what God was doing in his suffering, God had proven himself to be sovereign over all things. God had proven himself to be the perfect and righteous judge of all things. He will finally punish the wicked and vindicate the righteous. At the end of the story, Job was humbled, he was vindicated, and Job was comforted. Many modern readers of the story of Job will be inclined to put God's justice and character on trial. They will question if this God is worthy to be our God or not. They will question if doing right does not help us avoid suffering or to be saved from it, then is it still the right thing to do? But the story of Job actually turns the table on the reader and it is we who are put on trial. 
The accusation that Satan makes to God about Job is the very same accusation leveled at us. Do we fear God for no reason? In other words, do we fear and trust God only because He seems to be working in our favour? When we no longer see Him doing things as we prefer, will we disown Him? Will we rebel against Him? Will we do what is right only when it brings us reward? Or will we seek to be righteous and will we seek to hold fast our integrity simply because it is the right thing to do, even if it does not bring reward, even if it brings us suffering? Christian integrity means to uphold righteousness purely because it is the right thing to do in God's sight, even if there is no perceivable reward and even if it brings suffering. And for us to be a church that values integrity, the question that we must all grapple with is this. How can we do this very and extremely difficult thing? In short, how can we hold fast our integrity even in suffering? There is a prayer that can help us in this. And this prayer is a prayer used in all AA groups. Um, AA is, stands for Alcoholic Anonymous. It is an organization that helps people who wish to do the right thing uh, of getting out of alcoholism. And many of the participants in AA are there because they had turned to alcohol to escape their sufferings in life. Now, it is often a tough journey to get out of an addiction. And every day, they have to fight away temptations to return to drinking while dealing with their problems in right ways. Every day is a battle to choose to do what is right over returning to alcohol. And virtually all of them are taught this prayer to give them a perspective of life that will help them to fight to win the battle each day. This prayer is popularly called the serenity prayer and it goes like this. It says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Now these four lines in the prayer reflect a profound Christian perspective of life that strengthens us to hold fast our integrity in suffering. Firstly, it encourages us to be humble because the truth is that we are not God. If it helps us to remember it, can you please turn to one another and say, you are not God. And that is the truth. We are not God. We do not know everything. We do not control everything. And we do not have the power to change everything. Now, a lot of our suffering actually comes from agonizing over things that we simply have no control over, or we become anxious about the things that we can never know, about the unknown. We cannot control how our employers will treat us. We cannot control whether a storm will mess up our day or destroy our property. We cannot control people who will try to scam us or exploit us. And we will never know perfectly whether what you anticipate tomorrow will materialize. The day may be worse than you imagine, or it could be better than you anticipate. No amount of your worrying or agonizing over these things is going to change them, because you have no control. Letting go of trying to know and control everything is a step to easing our own suffering. But to do that requires humility. Humility is not weakness and resignation. Instead, it is courageous honesty to concede that we are not God. It is to concede that there are things that we cannot control. And if we can humbly acknowledge that God is greater than us, then we can entrust the things that we cannot control to Him because only He can order them according to His good will. So humility to acknowledge that we are not God, to let go and to let God be God. But just as there are things that we cannot control, there are also things that we can control. And what we can control are the choices that we make. And that is what we are responsible for. 
Now, some choices are harder than others to make, and so we ask God for courage. And then if you choose and do what is right, but in the end it does not result in the outcome that it should because of things that are outside your control, then you have done your part. You have carried out your responsibility. That is all that you could have done. And God does not ask anything more from you. So accept it. In accepting that you are responsible only for the things within your control and not for what is beyond your control, then you have the peace to loosen your grip on your circumstances and the things that are causing your suffering. And only in loosening your grip on these things can you hope to find peace. And when you have peace, then you gain strength to persist in choosing right. But of course, we need wisdom to discern what is within our control and what is not. And so we ask God to give us wisdom to teach us and to guide us. And according to the promise in James chapter 1, verse 5, when we ask God for wisdom, He will give it to us. So after we have asked God for wisdom and guidance, whatever He impresses upon our hearts to do and that is within our control to do, let us do them. Let us not second-guess God. Now, if we only knew these four lines to pray and to guide our living, it would already be a good start to holding fast our integrity in suffering. And these four lines of prayer has helped thousands of people in AA choose what is right, even while they are still suffering. But there is more help. Because this prayer in its popular version is only one-third of the original prayer that is commonly attributed to a 20th century theologian called Reinhold Niebuhr. The full version goes like this. It says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with Him forever and ever in the next. Amen. Now, much biblical wisdom can be gleaned from these remaining parts of the prayer. But in our time left, allow me to just state some thoughts that I hope will enable us to be helped by this prayer. Firstly, this, the remaining part of this prayer it encourages us to live one day at a time with God's help. Often we find ourselves unable to do the right thing because we try to think of all the possible outcomes if we chose that action. And we try to think of what it will bring tomorrow. And tomorrow here can mean literally tomorrow, the day that is coming. Or it can figuratively include some far-off future that we, have no reasonable, uh, that we have no reasonable knowledge of. But the fact is that we cannot know what will happen tomorrow. So it is enough for us to make the decision we can do right with only what we can know now. You can only make decisions based on what you can know now. And as it is written in Matthew 6.34, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. And if we are able to do this, if we learn to do this, we may find that amid suffering, we may even find some moments of enjoyment. The second thing that the prayer does is that it encourages us to accept hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. And this is a paradox of life. When you try to find happiness by trying to avoid or to escape hardship, you will never find happiness. But when you accept hardship and learn to live with it, then you will find happiness. Often we suffer because we compare our present to an idealized situation in our heads. And then in doing that to our real hardships, we add on the suffering of discontentment and bitterness. We will find it easier to face the reality of suffering in our fallen world and choose what is right in it if we follow Jesus. And following Jesus sometimes is confounding. 
It always confounds me why Jesus, being God, would not just, you know, like Thanos in the Avengers movie, just snap his fingers and make all things right. Why did Jesus instead come into our world and be misunderstood, betrayed, rejected, humiliated, tortured, and crucified? Why would Jesus do that? Is that really the better way? But if I will be humble, I will perceive that if Jesus, being the very wisdom of God, saw that it is a better way to deal with evil and suffering in the world, then rather than question his way, I need to learn from it. And his way is to take the world as it is and to simply live my best in it. And then we begin to adopt Jesus' perspective of suffering. Now, sometimes people look to Christianity as a form of escape. But you know the truth is that Jesus did not offer escape from present suffering. Instead, Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who suffer for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is Jesus' perspective of suffering. Sometimes in order to be a Christian may well be harder than if you were not a Christian at all. You would not have to grapple with whether to continue trusting in God or not. You can just give up on life and do what you want. But this is Jesus' perspective of suffering. Now, in saying this, Jesus was not in denial. He was not denying the harsh reality of suffering and how painful it can be to choose right for suffering. Jesus did not pretend that suffering can simply be smiled through. No. Instead, Jesus was honest with his suffering and pain. And he brought his suffering and pain, he brought all of it to God, his Heavenly Father, in raw honesty. When he was suffering the anticipation of his impending torture and execution, he didn't pray as this popular song goes, God, you are so good. He also didn't sing, I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole. He didn't sing any of these lines in his suffering. Instead, he prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. That was his raw honesty before God. On another occasion, in excruciating pain on the cross, Jesus didn't pray, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Instead, he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus did not deny his pain. Jesus did not employ positive thinking. Instead, Jesus threw himself at God. He trusted that God knew his heart and understood his pain and that God would not condemn him for his honesty. And you know what? For many people, including Job, crying out to God without feeling like they need to put on a religious front and to simply pour out their anguish before God has led them to encounter God in a very profound way. And in that encounter, somehow, somehow, they receive God's assurance that He sees, He hears, and He knows their pain. And although it may seem otherwise, they received assurance that God has not forsaken them, that God is still with them. And because He is still with them, they become bold and courageous to choose what is right even while still suffering. Now, thirdly, the prayer encourages us to trust that Jesus will make all things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next. In other words, live with confidence in the mystery of faith that we proclaim every Sunday when we come to the Lord's table. And that is Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is will come again. Jesus has promised that at the end of time, as surely as He had died and risen again, He will come again. And in that day, all the dead will be raised back to life and all the dead who have been risen to life will be judged by Him. And in that day, Jesus will vindicate 
He will heal and He will restore all who trust Him and all who persist in righteousness amid the injustice, all who persist in righteousness amid the sickness, all who would persist in righteousness amid their loss. But those who persisted in evil, those who turned to evil and caused the suffering of others, God will justly condemn them to eternal torment. No one will escape. No one will escape God's righteous judgment. And in that day, Jesus will make things right. He will consummate a new world where those who seek Him and His righteousness will live forever with Him in peace, in joy, eternally. And this is a word for those, uh, especially for those who are now suffering unjustly because of something that someone did or is doing to you. And perhaps you may be feeling trapped and helpless. Perhaps you may be finding it so difficult to choose to be kind and compassionate and forgiving and to serve others. Why should you, since you have been wronged and hurt? Except that you know that that is the way of Jesus. That compassion, forgiveness, grace, kindness, that is the way of Jesus to break the cycle of evil, hatred and vengeance to bring about peace, repentance, and reconciliation. We often suffer because we want justice and we want it now. But because we don't see it, we either suffer restlessness to work justice for ourselves, or we trap ourselves in the prison of bitter helplessness. But if we will trust God, that at the right time He will work justice for you, then you can learn patience and forbearance to wait for God to act on your behalf. And since God will judge rightly in the end, then you can put down the burden of being judge, jury, and executioner. As it is written in your anger, do not sin. It is also written, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Because God will judge, you can leave the ultimate judgment to him. And in doing so, you can be freed from a defensive heart to be kind, to be merciful and forgiving. The serenity prayer is a prayer that God will answer and give you the help and wisdom asked for in it. And I commend it to us for appropriation for ourselves when we find it hard to hold fast to integrity in our suffering. Now, like Job, it really might have been easier to give up on God and living a righteous life. By throwing their integrity, or by throwing his integrity to the wind, he could well be spared from the suffering brought about by insisting on doing what is right. And perhaps many of you are in that same position. You could have a much easier life if you just gave up on integrity. But Job chose not to. And I know many of you have chosen not to. You have held fast to your integrity in suffering. You would not deny God and you would not give up on doing the right thing. And I do believe that you can do this because in your suffering, like Job, you would not let go of God. Instead, you clung on tightly to Him. Brothers and sisters, God has called us to embrace integrity as our higher value. I know that it is a hard sermon today to hear, but that's the price of integrity, and that's the price that Jesus Himself paid. And if we want to follow Jesus, then Jesus also said, and that is the cross that we have to carry. And so as we bring our sermon series on integrity to a close, let us be determined with God's help to hold fast our integrity. Let us choose what is right in God's sight, even in suffering. And be assured of this, at the end, God will not let us down. And just as you share in Christ's suffering for the sake of righteousness, the Word of God says that you will also share in His glory as a true son and a true daughter of God in his kingdom.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In our closing prayer, let us use this prayer that we have gone through today. And let us say this prayer together. Together, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next. Amen.